Welcome to the fourth and final episode of the Overwatch League offseason recap. It's been one heck of a journey, but this is where it ends. After covering all of the teams in the Pacific Conference, as well as the ones from the Atlantic North Division, it's time to give some love to the Atlantic South. I'm sure most of you get how this series works already, but let's quickly review for those who are watching for the first time. So in this series, I go over every single move made by five teams from a specific division. But to make things a bit more interesting, I also give a quick one or two sentence overview of what I think of said team when thinking about their offseason. After recapping what happened, I will give some general thoughts on the moves they made and even throw in a letter grade based on how well I believe they handled their offseason. And that's just about everything you need to know about the format, so without wasting any more time, let's get started. The Washington Justice. Not too bad guys, but your team is kind of small. The Justice were a team who remained relatively quiet when it comes to signings. I cannot say the same for that release list though, this is quite extensive. But I'm sure this comes as a surprise to absolutely nobody after the kind of season they had in 2019. There were some major issues that needed to be worked out and the Justice wasted no time. When looking at their coaching staff, it was obvious they were doing a poor job. Because they were horrible for three quarters of the year, the entire coaching staff got kicked. I'm talking everyone, head coach Wizard Young, gone. Assistants Avala, MKL, and Shrugger, gone too. The Justice were ready to move on from the Wizard Young era and start off fresh, but before doing so, some roster changes needed to happen, and the Justice made quite a few of them. To start, their tank line of Janus and Sansom were both released, with Janus announcing he'd be taking a break from Overwatch to complete his military service back in South Korea. It's really sad to see things end this way for this tank line though. They played so horribly during the GOATS meta, but they truly started to come into their own during Stage 4. It's a shame this wasn't enough to keep them around. On the same day of the Janus and Sansom news, Hianu and Otto did get their contracts renewed either, and I can't say I'm all that surprised to see either of them get the boot, since one of them was never utilized and the other one was straight up not good. It really is a shame that the auto pickup didn't work out in particular. I was really hoping to see him shine on a new team. After these initial goodbyes were said though, Sleepy and Guido would join the I Need a New Team club. It's very sad to see Guido's career continue to go down this path, I'm not gonna lie. From Apex MVP to Overwatch League reject, it truly is a shame. The Sleepy thing is pretty interesting to think about too. The Justice made this big effort to trade for the guy halfway through stage 2 just to let go of him by the end of the year. Regardless of how strange that is though, the Justice were ready to move on and build around Corey. But before getting any new players, the Justice had to get a new coaching staff, and I have to say, I think they got a good group of guys. They start by hiring John Gull of the LA Gladiators to be their new head coach. Along with him, former Spark coach Supreme was brought in as a development coach, Wiz of XL2 Academy would become their strategic coach, and former Houston Outlaws main support Bonnie became an individual coach. When it comes down to player additions, the Justice did a couple of things. First, they made sure to re-sign Ark on a new deal. Next, they surprisingly brought in Roar from the LA Gladiators to give them a second option at main tank. It's not really too crazy to think about anymore, but at the time of this move, it was pretty unexpected. I'm assuming that Roar ended up on this team either because the Justice wanted another main tank on the roster, or because their head coach John Goat really enjoyed coaching Roar on the Gladiators during Season 2. Either way, it's a halfway decent pickup since Roar does have a ton of untapped potential. The next addition is Tuba. For those who don't know him, Tuba most recently played for the Chinese contenders team known as Bubble Burster Gaming, but before that, he was part of a few well-known Korean contenders teams such as O2 Blast and MVP Space. With Otto no longer on the team, a third DPS player was desperately needed, and Tuba could be a sleeper signing who puts in the work, either off the bench or even as a starter perhaps. To conclude the Justice offseason as of this recording though, former Boston Uprising flex support player Aimgod was signed in free agency to take the place of both Sleepy and Guido. That puts the Justice at an 8 man roster, and that is the league minimum. With that said, don't be surprised if the Justice do anything right before the season begins or even during mid-season. So yeah, that's what the Washington Justice have been up to. They certainly did more good than bad. I'm a little disappointed to see Sleepy and Sansom off the team in particular since I don't really think they are that bad, but I mean, Aim God is definitely an upgrade and Ellie Vote seems pretty capable as well. And I mean, you retained Corey, Stratus, and Ark while also making some well-needed changes with the coaching staff. I honestly believe the coaching changes alone are a really good step in the right direction. Wizard Young just doesn't seem like he's meant to be a head coach, and I think John Goat could be a great replacement. Overall, I think the Justice deserve a B plus for an offseason grade. This team seems like they're in a much better position compared to last year, but I still do have a few concerns. For one, a roster this small seems like it could end up being a mistake. It's true the Justice don't have to travel nearly as much as other teams, but having backups on hand are good to have since you never know what could happen in life. 
Also, I'm not entirely convinced their tank line will be good yet. Roar, Lulcic, and Elivolt have a ton to prove before I'm confident in them. I pray everybody on this roster have no issues and can hold their own. I hate to see this team have to purely depend on Corey to carry them to relevance. The Houston Outlaws. Okay, now this is a team I can get behind. After failing to make the end of season playoffs for a second year in a row, Houston knew they had to go all out during the offseason to try and avoid the same fate in year three. And now that their org had new ownership and money to spend, it was time to make a serious splash. Let's see what happened with their coaching staff first. So, first off, the Outlaws parted ways with head coach Tyronk and his assistant Hianwu. To bolster their coaching staff, some big changes were made. For their head coach, the Outlaws signed Harsha. That in itself is massive. During his time as an assistant on the Vancouver Titans and the 2019 World Cup team for the United States, Harsha received a ton of credit for helping both of these teams find success, and he certainly is a big upgrade over the likes of Tyrong. Working with Harsha this year will be Hurag, who retired from Pro Overwatch and is coaching for the first time in his career, and Dream, who spent time on Montreal Rebellion and British Hurricane. As for the player roster, some very interesting changes occurred. In terms of departures, the Outlaws saw four players leave the roster. Arhan was let go of and is now coaching contenders, and Bonnie, as I said before, is now coach on the Justice. But the Outlaws also had two retirements. Their franchise poster boy Jake is now a caster in the Overwatch League, and Cool Matt stepped down from his player role and is now a logistics manager for the Outlaws. Now for the new pickups. The obvious one that immediately comes to mind is the signing of former NYXL off-tank Mecco. I have to give the Outlaws some credit for bringing in such a big name free agent. Off-tank has been a very weak link for the Outlaws, and I believe Mecco could really change that if he becomes comfortable playing for a Western team. Funny story about the Mecco signing though, according to Flame while he was on Golden Boy's podcast, he wasn't even on Houston's radar to begin with. They assumed that Mecco wasn't interested in playing for a Western team. Instead, Mecco's agent approached the Outlaws on their Facebook page asking to get into contact. It would seem Mecco had strong interest in playing for a Western team right from the start. Getting back on topic though, the Outlaws weren't quite done with adding Korean players to this primarily Western roster after Mecco, and they did so by making huge strides with their support line with the addition of both Jexay and Rappel. And I for one believe these pickups will be very beneficial. More on that in just a few moments though because the Outlaws also made some stuff happen at DPS. In a surprising turn of events, the Outlaws secured a deal with Hydration to replace the hole left by Jake. Then they also got some extra reinforcement at the flex DPS position by trading with Boston for Blase. And that's pretty much what the Outlaws have been up to. They addressed a majority of the issues I wanted them to look at. The Mecco, Repel, and Jexai signings in particular are so huge. Mecco is miles better than Cool Matt or Spree ever were, and both Repel and Jexai give the Outlaws some needed options for their support line. I have always wanted Houston to give Rocket some competition for ages. He's had a lot of moments in his career where he seems like a weak link to the rest of the team, but now that might not be a problem anymore. For one, you can straight up play Repel over him, who is a relatively good player. I know he kind of just stood in the shadow of Twilight last year, but trust me when I say he'll at least be a decent player. And even if Rockus is still the starter, it likely means that he worked extra hard to improve and make sure Rappel didn't take his spot in the starting lineup. It feels like a win-win situation if you're an Outlaws fan. As for the Jexay move, I'm expecting him to be the starter right from day one unless his English is really bad. Boink in my opinion is a bottom tier main support and having him as your only option would not have been pretty. Jexay has a higher skill level and he is a vocal player with that good leadership quality you're looking for. This team screams improvement on paper. I'm extremely happy with the offseason for the Outlaws, so my offseason grade for them will be an A-. The Outlaws did so much to impress me. Everything from the coaching to the player selection was all very well executed. However, I don't feel they deserve a higher grade for a few reasons. For one, they still don't have another main tank. Don't get me wrong, Muma is decent, but there certainly are better options. Even just having a backup on hand would have been nice. Also, as much as I love Linkser, I think having a second hitscan player on this roster is a really smart idea. We all know that when Linkser is feeling it, he's practically unstoppable. However, his Overwatch League career has been plagued by inconsistency. He goes through tons of cold streaks. Having a second Widowmaker specialist on hand would make it so you don't have to worry about Linkser if he's going through a cold streak. The Outlaws dropped the ball there if you ask me. Oh, and one other thing, while I like their new players, I'm unsure of how successful Mecco, Rappel, and Jexay could be on a Western team. They might not be able to play up to their full potential, and that does kind of concern me. Still though, my hat goes off to the Outlaws for taking care of business. A job well done. The Florida Mayhem. Are you guys not trash for once? So the Florida Mayhem were fairly quiet this offseason. They made a handful of moves, but they all came in a relatively short time frame. 
To start, I wanted to bring up their general manager, Barehand, stepping down from the team and being replaced with Yeh. Usually, I wouldn't address a change at the GM position, but in this scenario, I felt it was necessary as Barehands has universally been recognized as a terrible executive during the time he spent with Florida, so I tend to believe this is a significant change. Other than management receiving a change, Florida also shook up their team both at the coaching and player positions. For goodbyes, head coach on red and assistant coach KH1 were let go from the staff side of things. For players, five people were relieved of their duties. Those people are Swan, Zephyr, Rain, Hagopun, and DPI. And if I'm going to be honest, none of these players leaving is a surprise. Other than Hago during Stage 4, none of these guys made consistent contributions towards any kind of success this franchise found in Season 2. And the thing with Hagopun is that he was rumored to have been this distraction to the rest of the team. So even if he was skilled, there was no point in keeping him around. As for the other guys, well, they were kind of all just riding the bench anyway, so why bother wasting a contract on them? As far as I'm concerned, Hago was the only guy they let go of who could have been a worthy backup at this point. All in all, I think Florida did well when it comes to getting rid of the pieces that either held them back or were completely useless, and to make up for these cuts, the Mayhem made four good signings. The first two are their new head coach, Kuki, and his assistant, Docs, who comes from MVP Space. And for those who don't know, Kuki spent time coaching Runaway shortly after he retired from the league. And overall, the team was pretty successful under his guidance. During the four months he spent there, Runaway won a season of Korean contenders and even finished top three in the 2019 gauntlet. With his experience as a player and his obvious skill as a coach, I think he might have what it takes to help Florida be a more relevant franchise. But wait, Kuki's not the only product of Runaway joining the Mayhem. He's bringing the DPS player Yaki and the flex support player Gang Nang Jim alongside him into the mix. Although these were the only new players signed by the Mayhem as of this moment, they're still two good ones nonetheless. Both of them are arguably top three rookies at their respective positions, and I think they'll help out this team a ton. Yaki gives the Mayhem a true flex DPS who can play projectile heroes at a high level, and I believe Gangnam Jin is much better than Byram. When factoring in all that's transpired, I believe the Mayhem deserve a B for an offseason grade. This team definitely took some needed strides in the right direction, thanks to the young assets they got from Runaway, and I think them having someone they're familiar with, like Kuki, to coach them will be extremely helpful, and the fact that Kuki has played on the same team as Fate before is a nice bonus. As great as this looks for the Mayhem, I'm still a little concerned about them right now. I have no doubt in my mind this will be their best team in franchise history and everything, but only having Chris at main support seems kind of risky. He was pretty average in Season 2, so I think it would be in their best interest to sign somebody else at that position. Also, signing just two players the entire offseason in general is kind of weak when you consider how much room this team has for improvement. They still have three roster spots available, so why not get some use out of them, you know? I like the direction Florida is taking right now, but their quiet offseason is a little bit disappointing. The Atlanta Reign. You guys killed it. Now is the time to show the world what you're made of. The Reign are one of the few teams this offseason that truly impressed me. There were very few losses and some huge gains in return. I mean, look at what they lost, and you tell me if you think it's the end of the world. For staff, they lost a player development coach. That's it. Now granted, Cass is pretty good, but if he's your only loss, then you're going to recover just fine. And to make up for it, the Reign signed the former coach of GC Busan, Mentalist. During his time spent with that team, he helped guide them to multiple top 8 finishes and contenders. Now obviously, that isn't crazy impressive or anything, but he still does have good experience, and I've heard from many people that he's a reasonably decent coach. When looking at the players, it's slightly more concerning, but still not a huge deal if you ask me. So three players left the team. Dako and Enlayer got released, and Funny Astro was traded over to the Fusion. All three of these players are talented, yes, but none of them are needed, I feel. I mean, think about it. With Masa on the roster already, it was doubtful that Astro would see playtime anyway. Then with Dako, he was benched in favor of FRD a lot of the time in the second half of 2019. Plus, he was rumored to be toxic anyway, so why hold on to somebody like that? And with Enlier, he was basically only used on occasion throughout the regular season, so not a ton of use for him either. Now, to compensate for all of this, the Atlanta Reign made four big moves. For one, Gator was promoted to a full-time player, and joining him in the big leagues is his partner in crime Hawk from Atlanta Academy. This tank line was one of the best ones in contenders, and they surely could be a dangerous duo in Season 3 of the Overwatch League as well. Then of course there's the big ones, I mean it's even crazier than signing somebody like Hawk or Gator. To upgrade their DPS rotation, two top tier hitscan DPS prospects were signed. 
Edison came over from GC Busan and Korean Contenders, and Sharp, who played on Team Envy for about a year. These were two of the big name rookie hits and DPS players that everybody was talking about, and the Reign managed to sign both of them. This puts Atlanta in a situation where their roster is unbelievably loaded. Because of how strong they look on paper, I'm going to give them an A for an offseason grade. What I love about the Reign is the options they have at tank. You have two solid players at both main and off tank. Getting to choose between Pokebone, FRD, or Gator and Hawk sounds like a pretty good problem to have. And do I even have to mention the DPS? They are beyond disgusting. Erster plus either Edison or Sharp sounds like a top tier DPS line in the league potentially. The one thing I don't like though about this team is the lack of backups at support. Masa and Dogman are good, but being unable to sub them out even just once in a while could be problematic. Although I have heard rumors that the Reign are looking to sign a support player, so maybe I'll change their grade to an A plus if or when that ends up happening. Besides that one small detail though, I can't really complain. The Reign did so well, and I'm expecting this roster to be at title contender level. The Philadelphia Fusion. I see what you're trying to go for, but I have some questions. So after an up and down season that saw them miss out on the overall playoffs, Philly wanted to make sure something like this never happened again. To ensure they wouldn't disappoint anybody for a second year in a row, the team underwent some major changes. And it all starts by coming in with a completely different coaching philosophy. With co-head coaches Hayes and Namedhui being let go of, it was clear that this team was ready to take a more standard approach at this position. Hence why they only signed one head coach this time. Their guy now is former Seoul Dynasty coach KDG. During his time spent on Seoul, we saw some mixed results with some very interesting strategies he liked to utilize. I'm just hoping he doesn't switch around the starters too much again here in Philly because I think that could really affect a team like the Fusion. But hopefully the coaching additions of Moby Dick from Toronto and Saito from Paris can convince him to avoid something like this. Even though the coaching staff is completely different, the new and improved roster is where this team really shines. The Fusion really didn't lose any assets that were of use to them other than maybe Neptuno who signed with the charge. Neptuno has always been pretty good, but he certainly is replaced replaceable, right? As for the more expendable players let go of, Kib, Elk, and Snillo were among the people to get released. Elk and Snillo were two-way players anyway, so they weren't really of particular use, and Kib was basically just bench fodder who likely wouldn't get playtime anyway. So yeah, unless you count Neptuno, there weren't really any significant losses. But what's great is that the Fusion were quick to give their fans something to cheer about by revealing their initial 2020 roster. In it, we saw familiar names return, such as Carpe and EQO being re-signed, but there were also some newcomers, and a few of those so-called newcomers are mighty dangerous. To upgrade the off-tank position and give it some depth, the Fusion made a trade for Fury. Not only is Fury really good at pretty much everything he plays, but he's consistently been a top 3 off-tank in the Overwatch League for a long time now. To make things even scarier, they also promoted Alarm from their academy team who is the young flex support everybody's been talking about since Season 1. Many fans who have watched this guy have been counting down the days for when he finally becomes league eligible, and now that he's finally here, the rest of the league should feel very scared. I can easily see him being one of the best support players in the game, and even if he's not, he'll surely be an upgrade over somebody like Boombox. The two other new pickups from the video are Ivy, who they acquired in a trade with Toronto, and Funny Astro, who I mentioned while discussing the rain. I believe that both Ivy and Astro are great additions to the team as well, and I think I see a world in which both of them make contributions towards this team's success. But now we have to discuss the other two signings after the initial roster was revealed. First of all, we have Chipsa who sent the internet into a frenzy when it was announced he'd be joining the Fusion as a DPS player. Not going to lie, I still find myself scratching my head over this to this day. I can understand that he could be good in like a Doomfist meta or something like that, and that he's crazy marketable, but I doubt he'd ever play if he couldn't use Doom. But you never really know at the end of the day, I suppose. Perhaps they have something planned. As for a more serious acquisition now, Carpe was given some backup at Hitscan when it was announced the Fusion had signed Hisu from Runaway. Oh, and by the way, he's still 17, so he won't be eligible to play until the end of March when his birthday comes. But in all honesty, I see this as a pretty underrated pickup. This guy has some serious upside, and having him ready to go in case Carpe enters a cold streak is very smart. I love Carpe and all, he's one of my favorite players, but he was pretty up and down in Season 2, and there's no telling if he'll fix that consistency issue heading into 2020. In the case that he doesn't, he will be there to save the day probably, but if Carpe figures it out, then at least you still have him as a backup, right? 
Seems like a good situation no matter what the outcome is. Overall, I love what the Fusion did with this team. Pairing up Carpe with his friend Fury will surely make for a very formidable duo, and a support line consisting of funny Astro and Alarm sounds pretty nutty. Not to mention they still have Poco and some new potential options at DPS in case Carpe and or EQO underperform. I'm a big fan of this Fusion team, so I'll be giving them an A for their offseason grade. Like with Houston and Atlanta, I'm very impressed with how the Fusion handled everything. However, there's two main issues I still have with the Fusion that prevents me from giving them an A plus grade. First off, I already mentioned my potential concerns with the coaching, but second of all, Sato is still the only main tank on this roster. Don't get me wrong, I don't really believe Sato is quite as bad as others make him out to be because I believe his Winston and his Arisa have always been pretty decent. The only hero he really struggles with is Reinhardt really, but even so, I'm still not willing to admit he's anything better than average. Sure, he's not incompetent on every hero he plays, but I am concerned he'll continue to get outplayed by main tanks who are vastly superior to him. Against a weaker opponent, I could see the fusion hiding Sato if he becomes a weakness on this team, but this simply won't happen anytime they play a real opponent. It's sad too, because it's not like there's no good options out there for them to sign. Bumper, TZ, and Kaiser are all available, and if those guys are too expensive, they could still settle for somebody cheap, right? Having Sato be your only main tank could really end up backfiring, so I can't help but feel disappointed in the Fusion for not addressing this. I'm glad they have confidence in Sato and everything, but this is risky. Fusion fans better pray that Sato either holds his own or that the rest of the team can cover up any weaknesses he has. Otherwise, this season for the Fusion will go down as a disappointing and overhyped nightmare. Still though, if you look at the big picture, Philly did well. If Sato holds his own, then I could see this team being a realistic title contender. Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. The Fusion are about to show us what they're made of. And with that said, that wraps up my offseason recap for the Atlantic South Division. All of these teams did a good job of making improvements, so it'll be interesting to see how competitive this division pans out to be. But now I turn things over to you. What are your opinions for each of these teams? Let me know down in the comments section. And if you enjoyed this content, then make sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Also, consider following me on social media and becoming a channel member too. If you become a tier 2 member like Adam Sinnott, M Burst, and Railroader Cabal did, then you'll get shoutouts and some other awesome perks. But as always, thanks for watching today's video, I appreciate it a ton, and until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.